Hello, I'm Dan Gibson, and in this video I want to talk a little bit about archaeological evidence. This is an area of history that is often contested by the general public. How does one prove something about ancient history? What sorts of evidence prove that something happened or did not happen in ancient history? Well, let's consider two kinds of evidence. The first is textual evidence, and the second is what I would call archaeological evidence. Now, by textual, I refer to something that was written long ago. Now, how do we know if that is true or not? By archaeological evidence, I refer to something that is tangible, something physical that archaeologists can study. Perhaps the foundation of an old building, perhaps some pottery, uh, or some ancient items found at a specific layer of ancient soil. Perhaps a coin or even pollen or spores taken from ancient soil. So we have two lines of evidence that we can follow, but these are not independent of each other. By ancient texts, uh, they might be found written on the walls of a temple or a palace, perhaps written on a special memorial stone. So in this case, the, dif the difference between textual and archaeological evidence is blurred. So what is the difference? Well, some of it depends on how the text gets to us. If the text is written on a datable substance, it could be dated. But even that is tricky. Did someone at a later date chisel the text into the side of a mountain or on the side of a temple uh, so that we think it's earlier than it is? It's a difficult scenario to investigate, and there's a whole science of dating weathered rock to determine how old the inscription actually is. Now, on the textual side, we have the issue of old manuscripts. How old are they? Since the printing press is relatively modern, was the manuscript copied from a copy from a copy? The dating of manuscripts is a tricky thing. We might be able to carbon date the material, perhaps of the vellum page used in a manuscript, but that only gives us an idea of when the animal died. Carbon dating is only good within a certain time frame, and that is why you see plus and minus dates attached uh, to uh, carbon dating. Sometimes the date is given with a plus or minus of 100 years or more. That is because, in that case, it would be impossible to date it any more accurately. But even then, the vellum skin might have hung for many years before it was used as a writing surface. So the writing might have been put on by uh, onto an older piece of uh, skin, in this case, uh, that may be skins that were hung for, for curing. So the carbon date only tells us when the animal died, not when the scribe actually wrote on the material. Now, one of the tricks that modern forgers use is to find an old book or scroll, hundreds, maybe a thousand years old, and find a blank page or a blank part of it, and then they would cut out that uh, blank part or remove that blank page. Now they have a piece that carbon dates back hundreds or thousands of years. You see, we cannot tell exactly when the scribe puts the ink on the page, unless, of course, he uses modern ink, because uh, ink compounds have changed over the years. So today, we have very few original ancient manuscripts. By ancient, I mean like the Roman historians or the Greek historians or Jewish scribes or Muslim scribes. Please don't imagine that the original copy of the Bible or the Roman histories or even the Quran exists in some long lost place. Today, usually all we have are copies of copies of copies. So, two strands of evidence have been developed. On one side, we have the manuscripts, uh, usually copies of copies of copies, although there are some uh, writ things written on temple walls that are datable, and there is graffiti written on walls and so forth, and uh, maybe out in the desert on things or peep things written on pottery. So today the general public often demands that historians and archaeologists come up with archaeological proof that something uh, is that is said in a manuscript. So, let's look at the archaeological record for a few moments. 
archaeologists research back into history, looking for clues and evidence of what life was like long ago. They have several things that make their job difficult. The first is that uh, people who came after did not respect or preserve the evidence from the life before them. Just look at a modern city. How much of the old city still survives? And the older the city, the more difficult it is to find earlier evidence. Often archaeologists have to look at old graves. They even go through old garbage dumps, uh, abandoned sites or whatever, looking for evidence. These don't always give a complete picture of what the ancient history was like. It just gives us some glimpses, maybe some different perspectives. So when looking at an ancient site, the archaeologist must view the history of the site through many different layers, older, older, older layers as they go down. Determining those layers and telling them apart requires great skill and training and uh, being able to do it and that's a job that archaeologists are trained in. So what do you do with an object that exists in multiple layers? Was it sunk down like a fence post and later a person put it down? Or was it something that was there and standing and later it was covered up? Now, let's come to ancient sites like Castor el Bint in Petra. This large square-like temple stands in the center of Petra. It's been there for over 2,000 years, uh, maybe, uh, maybe 2,000 years, over 1,000 years for sure. When was it first built? Is there evidence uh, of an earlier temple underneath? Was it always a temple? If it was a temple, then what gods were worshipped there? Uh, were there always the same gods there? Were the original ones lost, perhaps destroyed in a war? Were later gods worshipped there by later people? Were there several gods worshipped there at the same time? What will happen if we don't find any evidence of idols there? Is it still a temple? In this case, archaeologists will have to use manuscript evidence to support their interpretations. And so we have uh, many different issues coming along. Do the manuscripts support the archaeology? Does the archaeology support what the manuscript said? Um, which has the most authority? Well, in most cases, historians have to consider both manuscript and archaeological record if they have them. This is the part of makes it difficult because a historian like myself or an archaeologist who comes along. Now, archaeologists do the actual digging in the soil, looking for hard evidence, and then they look to manuscripts to confirm or to see and uh, to throw some light onto what they've discovered. Historians like myself do our digging in the manuscripts, and then we look at archaeology and what is discovered to confirm what we find in the manuscripts. Two slightly different approaches. Please remember, I am a historian, not an archaeologist. Although I have a keen interest in what archaeologists are discovering, sometimes I come up with slightly different interpretations than the archaeologists and the official report. Take, for example, the catapult stones found in Petra. Those were found by archaeologists from Brown University. Now, as they were digging, I was making visits to Petra and observing their process, uh, progress. I lived in a nearby village and I had ready access as my uh, residence permit was through a joint project sponsored by the Jordanian Ministry of Tourism and also the Ministry of Antiquities. So I came multiple times uh, to the site and I looked at not only what they were digging, but also what other sites that were under development excavations going on. While the archaeologists were busy digging, Dr. Artemis Tchaikovsky, the husband of the famous archaeologist Dr. Martha Tchaikovsky, showed me several things about the dig that archaeologists were puzzling over at the time. They had found two puzzling things, often called anomalies. The first was defensive structures that had been found in what was known as the Great Temple. Uh, these they could date because the defenders used building materials from the roof, which had collapsed during an earlier earthquake. Also, there was the presence of catapult stones nearby. And since the archaeologists did not know of any major battles fought in Petra during those years, they decided that the catapult stones were just in storage. Of course, later people may have cleaned up the site and moved the stones off to the side. 
But as a historian who digs in old manuscripts, I immediately recognize that this could be a link to something in Islamic history. Now, why am I saying all of this? A number of people respond to my videos and they've used arguments about the absence of archaeological evidence for certain things. Let me just give you an example I hear many times, and that's the thorny issue of the Hebrew exodus from Egypt. When people argue that this did not happen because there's no archaeological evidence, I just shrug and shake my head. How do you answer such an argument? First, they're arguing that the absence of evidence is proof of something. Nothing could be further from the truth. There are many events recorded in history, and they're written down in history, but there's no archaeological evidence, and we probably never will have archaeological evidence. When I hear arguments like this used for the Israelite exodus, the first thing that crosses my mind is, what sort of evidence are you expecting? The usual answer is, well, there's no mention of this in the Egyptian records. Now, think about this. First, we have some trouble putting an exact date on the event. So, where should we look in Egyptian history? Second, there is some argument over which pharaohs ruled Egypt at which time. The chronology of the period is not 100% nailed down. More importantly, listen, what pharaoh would write down such a shameful defeat on the wall of his accomplishments. Think about it from an Egyptian perspective. This was somewhat shameful. It was a disaster. The slaves revolted and got away with it. Also from the Bible, there's no record that a pharaoh died during the events. There's no record that he was even present at the crossing of the Red Sea. Just his army officials were there. So as far as I am concerned, it is no surprise that there's nothing written from the Egyptian side. Also, I suspect that most of the Hebrews themselves did not read or write a great deal. Most had been slaves doing hard labor. Slaves seldom have time to learn reading and writing. The rest of them had been employed in keeping flocks of animals for the Egyptians. Plus, who had time to scratch anything on the walls of uh, the canyons when you were running away from the Egyptian army? Sorry, no graffiti's been found. None is expected. What about archaeological evidence like the foundation of buildings? Again, no one had time to build any buildings. The Hebrews had been herders of animals in Egypt before being pressed into hard labor. When they came into Egypt hundreds of years earlier, they lived in tents and they expected to eventually leave, so I do not imagine that they built any notable buildings for themselves. I would assume that they lived a semi-nomadic lifestyle, and when they left Egypt, they took their tents and their animals with them. So there would not be any building foundations. So the absence of evidence may actually indicate the presence of nomadic people who leave very little evidence behind. Now, they wander for 40 years in the desert until God allows them to go into Canaan. That is what the manuscripts tell us. So there's no archaeological evidence expected from this time. If you want to investigate this further, please see the video I made on the archaeology of nomads. Finally, when they enter into Canaan, we have the very first archaeological find of the Hebrews. And even then, it's spotty. It is mostly evidence of the damage they caused to the settled people. The biblical record indicates that they remained nomadic for at least another 400 years. Archaeologists have noted this as being a very dark era with very little urban development. So what kind of evidence were you expecting? I think the absence of evidence is possibly the greatest argument that the Hebrews existed and that their account is accurate. At least the archaeological record is consistent with the manuscript record in this case. Over and over again, different people have made arguments that the, the Hebrew manuscripts were written much later. 
they can make this argument based on the absence of earlier manuscripts. The very same argument is used against the existence of Muhammad in the early Muslim community. But again, how many manuscripts have survived to us over the years? I would hesitate to use the absence of evidence argument for the non-existence of an early Muslim community or even for the Israelite exodus from Egypt. Now, what about the evidence that does exist? Some writers have argued that the Old Testament is not as old as it claims to be and that it was written around 700 BC. They don't give a more modern date because there are some old manuscripts dating back to this time, so they can't say, well, it's more modern 700 BC. Again, my argument against this idea is that the Hebrew accounts contain names of places, names of kings, names of leaders that existed thousands of years earlier. Many of these places were unknown to archaeologists until just a few years ago. These events and people took place 1,300 years before 700 BC. The Hebrew records are full of names, hundreds and hundreds of names, names of places, names of kings, names of people, records of events. The likelihood that they just made up all these people, places and events, and that they don't contradict uh, archaeology, to me is evidence that the manuscripts exist from a much earlier time. And as archaeologists dig and turn up bits and pieces of evidence, these ancient people, these kings, these events are slowly confirmed. Not in one big earth-shattering way, just small discoveries, bits of pottery with a name on it here, a stamp or a seal of a court official here, or an ancient foundation found exactly where one would expect it to be. Now, as I have often said, when it comes to manuscript evidence, I'm a literalist. That means I think that people wrote down what they saw and what they understood during their time. I don't think people were making up fictional books of history. I think that even in what some people call mythology, that there was some original person or event that sparked the story. And of course, if it was not written down, it might grow or change over time. It might be exaggerated until it was written down or until it was memorized by bards or memorized by people who thought it was important, especially in the case of history. So when discussing Islamic history, please do not assume that I'm denying the existence of Muhammad or the early Muslim community. I quite strongly believe that there was a young man named Muhammad who experienced some notable phenomena and who was eventually supported by a small group of followers. The only difference is I placed the story in southern Jordan and not in Saudi Arabia. I'm Dan Gibson and this has been another video uh, in the series Talking with Dan Gibson.